So the talk is on nuclear propulsion in the UK. It was a collaboration between Lockheed Martin UK and Rolls-Royce up in Derby. Um, and obviously, yeah, presented it a couple of times, but it's been a few years since I've done it. So hopefully I can do it justice. Um, <clears throat> so just a bit about me. So I started my career at the University of Bath. I first applied there to do mechanical engineering. Um, so I did that for two years and then went to Honeywell Aerospace in Yeovil. Um, and down there they do uh, sort of environmental control systems and life support systems for civil and military aircraft. So I was a structures analyst, so I worked on stress analysis for um, those pneumatic systems. So it's taking um, bleed air from uh, the compressor in the engine, passing it through valves, heat exchangers, rotating compressor turbine assemblies, um, water separators, things like that, to pressurize the cockpit and cabin and also provide oxygen for the fighter pilot themselves. <clears throat> Once I returned back to uni, I realized aerospace was for me. So I transferred to aerospace engineering, um, did a couple of years in that. Um, and as part of what I learned during my industrial placement, I actually entered a competition uh, in my third year, which was run by an Indian company called Team Indus, And they were creating a lunar lander um, as part of the Google Lunar X Prize to um, land a rover, a uh, lunar lander on the moon, deploy a rover, take pictures, send it back to Earth. And as part of that program, they set up a competition called Lab to Moon, which was a student competition to create a payload for their lunar lander um, and do some useful science. So uh, my project was called Lunar Dome. Uh, it was an inflatable habitat that is the size of a soda can and it inflates a flexible uh, material to atmospheric pressure, maintains it for as long as possible. Um, uh, so yeah, we entered the competition. There was 3,000 entries and we ended up coming third. So we got a contract to put the experiment on the lunar lander. Um, and, and yeah, the rest is history. So um, <clears throat> yeah, after I left my fourth year at uni, I did a summer internship at Airbus Defence and Space in Portsmouth. Um, so they manufacture large telecom satellites for civil and military applications. So I was working in the mechanical design office, um, working on design of the payloads that go onto the satellites, um, also looking at stress and thermal analysis, um, looking at launch conditions and then in-service conditions, um, trying to make sure that everything can be signed off and um, put onto those large satellites. Uh, once I left uni, I joined Lockheed Martin. So I started as a graduate engineer, did that for two years, rotating around the business. Um, there's quite a wide variety of different roles you can do. So I started off in uh, land vehicles, did a couple of rotations there, and then moved to the more aerodynamic side of things, um, modeling and simulation, which is kind of what I do now been an associate member of the Royal Aero Society for a couple of years now um, and through that I won that any row medal. So that's pretty much me. So a bit of a disclaimer to start with, we always have to do these um, as part of these presentations. So the views and opinions expressed here are those of the authors and in no way represent the views, positions or opinions expressed or implied of my employer or anyone else. <clears throat> so getting on to the meat of the presentation, um, so nuclear propulsion. Um, a lot of people don't know that nuclear propulsion for space applications has been around for a long time. NASA uh, started investigating nuclear propulsion in the uh, 1950s to 1960s. Their kind of flagship program was called the NERVA, so the nuclear engine for rocket vehicle applications. Um, and this kind of was kind of a, a test program where they put hardware um, load of satellite on the ground. So they used a hydrogen fuel source, passed it through the reactor for a converging diver to measure efficiencies, thrust, um, and all sorts of different parameters. So the kind of um, basis for this study was a couple of things. So NASA in 2021 
published a request for industry to develop nuclear um, nuclear space propulsion technologies. So that's nuclear thermal propulsion and nuclear electric propulsion, which I'll get into more detail a bit later. Um, so that came out in 2021. There's been a load of contracts that have been given out since then. And recently, there's been a lot of investment in there in the past couple of months. Um, elsewhere in the world, China have announced that they're planning to produce a nuclear powered space shuttle by 2045. And the real meat of this presentation is about Rolls-Royce and their development. So in 2021, um, they produced a kind of roadmap for the UK to expand their technologies within uh, the space industry. Um, so I think at the moment, the UK takes about 4% of the space industry globally. And by 2030, they want to expand that to 10%. And Rolls-Royce are going to be a big player in that, especially on the nuclear side of things. Okay, so purpose of this study. Um, so as part of the project on nuclear issues conference that we presented in, we get a chunk of hours to do a kind of standalone study to assess something, write a presentation, then write a paper on it. So what we decided to do was investigate a comparison between conventional um, propulsion systems and nuclear propulsion systems in transporting both cargo and people from Earth to Mars. We looked into mission profiles around the mid 2030s um, and we were kind of comparing two kind of major um, quantitative values measures of how good a system is. So with cargo missions, obviously you want to transport as much payload as possible to the surface. Um, once you're there, you can then, if you've got a lot of mass there, you can bring a lot of science equipment, bring building materials, tools to create a habitat, um, create a base, create infrastructure, things like that. So you want to maximize the payload to surface in the cargo missions. In the manned missions, we want to minimize transport time. So that's for two reasons. One is to reduce the um, passengers' exposure to cosmic radiation, microgravity effects, which can affect your sort of bone, bone density, um, your muscle loss, etc. But also because transfer times typically take in the order of six, six to seven months. Um, so who wants to be in a spacecraft for six to seven months? Definitely not me. So trying to minimize that is beneficial. So next few slides, I'm just going to go through kind of a basic overview of different um, types of propulsion systems. Um, so starting with sort of chemical, um, conventional, uh, liquid powered rockets. <clears throat> so schema on the top right, um, you've got two different tanks. You've got your fuel tank, which typically contains combustible materials such as liquid hydrogen or something like kerosene, um, RP1, if you know about rocket fuels. And then you've got an oxidizer tank, which is pretty much solely there to initiate the combustion and maintain the combustion process. So typically that's liquid oxygen. Um, so benefits of these systems, you get very high thrust, so they're effective at both sea level and in a vacuum. So depending on your configuration of your nozzle, um, you can have your first stage to launch the rocket off Earth using a, a, a nozzle that's configured specifically to work in the atmosphere. And then you've got um, your second stage typically has a slightly different nozzle, which is um, configured to work in a vacuum. Um, so the way you sort of um, this kind of flows is you've got your two um, liquid propellants. They flow through the pipework that's in um, the system, goes through a couple of turbo pumps to increase the pressure um, as it goes into the combustion chamber. Once it's in the combustion chamber, the gases combine, um, the combustion process is initiated and maintained, and then it flows through a converging diverging nozzle to convert thermal energy and pressure into velocity, which is then reacted back through the rocket and forces thrust. So another benefit of this, uh, these types of systems is once you actually get to Mars, um, the fuels that you use are actually quite easily manufacturable. So both on Earth and Mars. So um, with this example I've got here, the SpaceX Starship, they use methane and oxygen. And there's quite simple chemical processes on both planets to be able to produce 
um, both fuel. So um, yeah, it's beneficial um, to be able to use those. The major downside, of course, is got a useful fuel tank and pretty almost redundant oxygen um, that you're using. So you normally have a six to one ratio uh, between the masses of each. So um, ideally, if you could remove the oxidizer tank and remove the oxidizer that's in it, you can replace that with useful payload. Um, so example I've got on there of a contract that's recently been awarded to SpaceX. Um, so I think, yeah, 2021, NASA awarded them a massive $3 billion, $3 billion contract to develop uh, the Starship to carry human to the moon um, as part of the Artemis missions. And in the future, they might be developing that into going to Mars as well. So getting onto the nuclear side of things. So it's two different types, two main types. So the first is nuclear thermal propulsion. And essentially it works in a similar way to the conventional case, um, except you've only got one fuel. So typically you use hydrogen and you pass the hydrogen through a similar kind of pipe work, um, turbo pumps. And then the main difference is that you've got a reactor, a nuclear reactor instead of a combustion chamber. And the nuclear reactor generates heat, transfers that to the hydrogen. And then it, it, again, it's, it, um, expanded through a converging diverging nozzle to produce thrust. Compared to conventional systems, um, no oxidizers required, so there's no oxygen there in the process at all. So as I mentioned, you get huge mass saving, um, which can be replaced with useful payload. But then a, a huge downside is, despite the fact that you're transferring heat from the reactor to the fuel, you still transfer a lot of heat to the surrounding structure as well. So you get reactor temperatures in the order of thousands of Kelvin um, and you need to do something with that heat. So you kind of need to design some quite complex cooling systems for the structure um, to ensure that everything stays intact, I guess. Um, so yeah, example I've got there, a recent uh, contract that's been awarded by DARPA to blow up Atomic and Lockheed Martin in the US to design a nuclear thermal propulsion system, um, which I believe is planned to be flight tested around in Earth orbit by 2027. It's a $27 million contract, but I think last week, NASA has uh, announced that they're gonna be joining forces with DARPA in this contract, and they're gonna be plowing a lot more money into this development. So um, I think it's an undefined amount of money at the moment, but, um, guessing it's going to be comparable to the to the ones we see with SpaceX. <clears throat> so finally, nuclear electric propulsion. So the main difference here is you're, instead of using the nuclear reactor as a heat transfer source, you use it as an electricity generator. So <clears throat> the way the thruster works is you start with the electricity coming off the reactor, comes through an electron gun, so you've got electrons being fired up. Then you've got the fuel coming around the outside of it and coming into the, the thruster as well. Typically, these fuels are inert gases such as xenon or krypton, which are much heavier than hydrogen or um, methane as typical fuels for the other two systems. So once the gas gets into the thruster, the electrons collide with the atoms in there and they knock off electrons from those atoms to ionize them. And then those ions are accelerated through a magnetic field and an electric field um, to really, really high speeds. So you can get uh, close to relativistic speeds around 10% the speed of this, um, the speed of light. Um, and then they're ejected out of the thruster. And there's a secondary neutralizing electron gun at the top, which then fires additional electrons back at the ions um, to neutralize their charge. <clears throat> So that's the way that produces thrust. Um, so typically you get a huge amount more efficiency from these thrusters. So 10 times more than chemical. Huge benefit is there's very few moving parts. So it's a mechanical engineer's dream. Um, very simple to design from a mechanical perspective. Um, but you get really good reactor uses on Mars. So because you're generating electricity with your nuclear reactor, 
you can essentially use that reactor to produce electricity once you actually arrive at Mars. So when you're producing your base, um, powering that, powering sort of rovers and things like that, you can use um, that useful energy there. So typically, I think reactors have lifetimes of around 10 years. So once you actually arrive on Mars, you've still got a huge amount of useful energy that you can use um, to, to use up. <clears throat> um, the downside is very low thrust. So typically you have to um, use these engines for in the order of weeks or months. So when you're traveling through uh, space, you have to have them on for a very long period of time to have any kind of meaningful velocity change of your spacecraft. Um, which means that they're only really useful in vacuums, so you can't use them to launch from the Earth's surface and escape the gravity field. So that means they kind of have to be used in conjunction with the other two, um, one of the other two uh, propulsion systems, so chemical or nuclear thermal to escape Earth. Then in your second stage, when you're already in a vacuum, you can then use these to their full potential. So then I've got an example of a, another contract which was awarded a few years ago to Ad Astra to develop a variable impulse nuclear electric thruster. It's a bit smaller contract this time, $10 million. Uh, the kind of announcement that I mentioned in the last slide where NASA are joining forces with DARPA. So not only are they investing in nuclear thermal propulsion, they're also plowing a lot of money into this technology. And this is the technology that Rolls-Royce are really interested in as well. So that was kind of a big focus for us. So as I mentioned, um, roles in the UK Space Agency are reviewing uh, the UK's future in the space industry, trying to lay out a roadmap for us to expand our market cap. So not only are they designing reactors, they're also designing spacecraft structures and systems. So in this example, um, you can see that the thrusters are on the left-hand side there. Um, and the crew and passenger compartment is way down on the other side of the spacecraft. So the reason for that is for uh, safety reasons. So you don't really want your humans to be close to your reactor. So separation is really useful in reducing the radiation dose. You can also put your fuels in between your reactor and your um, passengers. So that attenuates a lot of the radiation coming through as well. And then also you can use disc shields. So you can see these two black shields there, which are kind of high density material that can also reduce radiation um, exposed to the crew. And then that long boom you can see in between the two, um, an example of how elaborate your cooling system has to be. So if you've seen pictures of the International Space Station, you'll see a load of radiators coming out of it. And this is a similar thing where we're trying to cool down our reactor um, and project a lot of that heat to, as radiation into, into space. So there's a lot that needs to go into actual spacecraft design when we're thinking about these um, propulsion systems. <clears throat> so going into a bit of the analysis of what we actually did in this study. So we started off looking at a case study of the Starship, so SpaceX to transport masses of humans from Earth to Mars. Um, it's going to be a reusable spacecraft, so they're going to be looking back and all of the structure is going to be reusable. So working through this kind of mission profile, we start off uh, step one. So we've got a booster and Starship attached to the top of it, which is filled with passengers. The booster will launch into Earth orbit and it will stay there for a while. Alongside that, we'll have um, fuel tankers that will uh, launch, so it'll be boosters with um, a spacecraft that contains fuel as payload. They will launch into Earth orbit at the same time. They'll then perform um, orbital refueling around the Earth. And then the boosters, obviously when they separate, they'll return back to Earth again. Once the Starship with, which contains passengers, is then fully loaded with fuel, you then look at um, at step four, your long duration um, transport to Mars. So step four typically takes yeah, six months. Um, and it's longest duration, longest amount of um, intensity on your engines, your fuel burn, 
Um, so that's kind of the step that we're most interested in. That's the step you can get the most benefit out of using um, nuclear propulsion systems. So once you've arrived at Mars, you'll then perform a landing burn. You'll land on Mars. You will um, perform your mission. And as I mentioned earlier, it's quite easy to produce fuels once you actually get to Mars. So you can do in situ propellant production. All this time, we're going to have more and more ships landing. Uh, build, a, build up the amount of people we've got, the amount of infrastructure. Um, once we have good um, production facility fuel, we'll then be able to refuel our spacecraft, return back to Earth, and then redo the whole process. So, as I've said, step number four is the most interested, most interesting um, from a nuclear propulsion perspective. So that's the step we looked into as part of this study. So at the bottom there, we've got our cargo mission and human mission. So this is quite an old um, diagram. I think it's from 2016. Um, but at that time, SpaceX were predicting with a cargo mission, you can take 200 tons of useful payload to the surface per mission. And with human um, rated missions, you can take up to 100 passengers. So with all that in mind, um, kind of uh, used a bit of software that we could estimate the difference between the chemical propulsion system and the nuclear propulsion system to perform a mission to Mars on that step four. So we used a bit of software called GMAP, it's available open source, um, and we have it on site at Lockheed. Um, our assumptions were that we used the Starship conventional system, and we compared that against the nuclear thermal propulsion system with the nuclear reactor designed by Rolls-Royce. Further assumptions, um, we assumed it was a one-way interplanetary trajectory only. Essentially, the return leg gives you the same um, benefits, so we only looked at one way. Uh, we assumed that the spacecraft mass, uh, prime mass with no fuel in it at all, was identical between the two systems. We're doing knowledge as a shape because of all the safety things we were talking about, separating the passengers away from the reactor is quite an important thing to consider. And then finally, we assumed impulsive maneuvers. That means that when you perform maneuvers with your spacecraft, the velocity change occurs instantaneous, instantaneously. So there's no time duration while you're burning your, um, your fuels. You just assume that you go from one velocity to another velocity in an instant. So looking at the diagram we've got there, we've got the sun in the middle and then orbit, and the outer ring is Mars's orbit. And we've got two maneuver points there. We've got TOI, which is called a trans-orbital insertion. So once you're in Earth orbit, you perform a, a burn to escape Earth's gravity, and then you go in that orange trajectory towards uh, Mars. With Martian orbital insertion maneuver, where you flip your spacecraft in the other direction, burn your engines to slow down, and then you get captured in Martian, uh, the Martian gravity well. Um, yeah, so essentially, because obviously Earth orbits the Sun at a different rate to Mars, you need to be able to time this um, transfer uh, really well. So ideally, you'd want for Earth and Mars to be right next to each other on the same side of the sun. So here again, obviously Earth rotating around the sun, so is Mars. So Earth, you want them to be close, and then they kind of follow each other, get closer and closer, and then once you get to that position there, um, that's where uh, you land. So the way we kind of worked out these timings, um, we used the NASA design reference architecture for Mars, which kind of said, when each technology is available. So roughly in the mid 2030s is a good spot to um, perform these kind of missions. We then looked at the NASA's trajectory browser, which is an online tool, which tells you, uh, basically tracks the relative positions of Earth and Mars. And it kind of says, what is the most efficient time to leave Earth to get that really nice trajectory up to Mars. And we resulted in a cargo mission of 2035, and a crewed mission of 2037. So typically you get these kind of two year gaps just because of the way the orbits work. Um, two years is typically the 
the difference between useful um, trajectories. So running all of that information into our software, um, we're looking at cargo mission in 2035. So there's a few assumptions that we've made here. So as I said, dry mass is the same. The Starship with all of its fuel loaded up. So our assumption basically says we're going to drain the fuel, of, drain the ship of all of its fuel, the mass that's remaining, we're going to keep that the same, refill it with nuclear thermal fuel, so liquid hydrogen. The comparison between the fuel mass there is massive. So because of that oxidizer that uses up so much volume, um, we can remove that, fill it all with hydrogen, much lighter fuel, gives you a much lower fuel mass. Then you can perform your mission um, pairing conventional and nuclear, we get a payload to surface increase of about 20% with nuclear thermal. So that's without optimizing any of the structure, any of the actual design of the spacecraft, um, you get a pretty significant um, increase in payload. So then with the crewed mission two years later, so we kind of tackled this in a slightly different way where we make the same assumption about the dry mass. We're going to take 100, pay, uh, 100 passengers in both conventional and nuclear thermal. Same assumption about the fuel mass, but this time because we want to calculate the maximum velocity change that we can get out of our spacecraft. So um, running through the numbers, we can see that even with a much smaller fuel mass in nuclear thermal, we get an even higher uh, total velocity change, which allows you to escape Earth's gravity, get to a much faster velocity in the mid course. And then once you get to the Martian surface, you can still slow down, be captured by the gravity and perform that maneuver much faster. So I think in the conventional case, it was around six and a half months. In the nuclear thermal, it was about five and a half. And again, that's without optimizing anything else about the spacecraft itself. It's just comparing fuels. So here's a kind of visualization of how that looks. So on the left, we've got conventional trajectory, and on the right, we've got nuclear thermal. So you can see that with conventional, it takes much longer. Earth and Mars travel a lot further in that trajectory. Whereas in nuclear thermal, we get a much more aggressive trajectory where we're increasing our radius from the sun a lot quicker. We arrive at Mars a lot quicker. And all those good things about reducing radiation dose, reducing gravity, um, related uh, physiologic effects is beneficial for the passengers. So that was kind of the scope of the technical side of our study. Um, so obviously we've only compared conventional and nuclear thermal. Um, if we were to do this in more detail, so we've only looked at that step four in that mission profile. In reality, if you were to design a mission like this, you'd have to consider the initial orbit around Earth and the final orbit around, um, around Mars. And each of those have six different variables that you'd need to optimize. So in total, you'd have 12. Um, and then you've got that transfer as well. So it's a much more complicated problem once you start building these um, additional maneuvers up. So um, that was out of scope of what we did. If you were to design a proper mission, you would um, do those kind of numbers properly. So the other thing was um, in this GMAT code, you can kind of decide what uh, level of complexity you want in terms of which bodies you include in the solar system. So here we only looked at Sun, Earth, and Mars, but there's also many other bodies in the solar system that could have their gravity affecting the spacecraft. So if you were, again, to do this in more detail, then you would include those extra bodies. So then kind of missed out nuclear electric in this. Um, so the reason for that was that assumption about impulsive maneuvers where you know, our velocity change in with nuclear electric because you're using, you're basically thrusting your um, spacecraft for weeks or months. Um, that assumption is no longer valid. And it makes the analysis a lot more complicated when you're trying to burn for a long period of time, change directions, burn for another long period of time, and then arrive at Mars at the perfect spot, perfect velocity. So um, yeah, that takes a lot more com computational power than, um, than we had. 
And also, as we were saying, you need a hybrid propulsion system typically. So to escape Earth, you probably need a conventional nuclear thermal engine anyway. And then once you get to Earth orbit, you place your second stage with a nuclear electric. Um, so yeah, that obviously as a whole mission, that will cause a lot more complexity in your design of your spacecraft, your uh, equations that you're trying to solve. But um, having looked at some of the numbers you get from the efficiencies in thrusters, so I've kind of said with specific impulse there, which is kind of a measure of how um, efficient the fuel is and the uh, engine system, typically get 380 with conventional, you get around double that with nuclear thermal, so you get around 10 times with nuclear electric. So when we're thinking about the uh, case of humans on board, we're looking at delta V budgets, change in velocity, you get a slight improvement with nuclear thermal, but with nuclear electric, you get four times more um, change in velocity, which would significantly decrease your um, transfer time from Earth to Mars. So in conclusion, kind of already said, you can see um, sort of improvements on both cargo missions and manned missions using Rolls-Royce designed nuclear reactor in a nuclear thermal propulsion system to reduce your payload step in a cargo mission by 20% and you can decrease transfer time in manned missions by 17. Um, obviously, if you're designing a mission properly, increase. That's pretty much it. So I'll open the floor to questions. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it interesting. Also, uh, any questions in the audience? Um, I'll bring the microphone over. Thanks. A couple of questions, um, really on the nuclear power plants, which is not really my field, but I get the impression from normal nuclear power plants that these are fairly slow to start up and to shut down. Um, when you put the control rods in you know, to mitigate the fusion reaction, then it takes a long time for the thermal mass to decay. So I assume for this that you sort of light the fuse on this rocket and wait a week before you climb into it. Yeah, so um, sorry, and, and how does that work when you're in, in flight and you want to do another burn? Do you shut it down? When you're coasting, or uh, yeah, so obviously, kind of nuclear um, reactor side of things was Rolls Royce's expertise there. So um, I'll probably give the best answer I can. Um, so what I'd assume before you launch your spacecraft, you would initiate the fusion react uh, fission reaction in the reactor before you launch. So by the time you actually get to launch your reactor is already producing heat, it's already at the kind of um, equilibrium conditions that you need to be able to pass fuel through it. Um, second question is on, once you get into space, how do you stop a, stop a burn and then restart it? So I think that kind of comes with the cooling system. So what I'd assume is you would keep your reactor um, doing fission for the entire duration of the mission at a constant rate. Um, you constantly be rejecting heat while you're traveling. And once you need to relight your engines, you would then have the right conditions to be able to pass fuel through at any time. So that's probably the best answer I can give without getting an expert. Right. And the, the follow on to that really was the nuclear electric. Um, you sort of said it was fairly simple with few fusing part, but my thing is that if you look at a standard nuclear power station then yes there is a big reactor vessel but then alongside it there are some enormous generators yeah. all of which have got great big steel masses hurtling round and round with enormous gyroscopic effects so with your how do you generate the electricity is it a complete yes. I, I, I know that electrical generation technology is what 150 years old but it's still got some fairly significant problems with it. And of course, working fluids, sodium or water or? So again, not an expert in nuclear power production, 
Um, I do know there are systems out there that can convert heat to electricity directly. So think about uh, Formula One cars when they do regenerative braking, they convert heat directly to electricity without the need of a working fluid. I don't know if that creates enough electricity to be able to power a thruster, um, but I'm assuming there's some clever new technology that has been developed to be able to eliminate the need for maybe not eliminate working fluids entirely, but um, be able to generate it in some other form. Oh, um, any other questions in the audience? Okay, I'll... Uh... Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned earlier there was an assumption about um, assuming that the velocity changes instantaneously, and as we're looking at the propulsion systems where the thrust is becoming lesser and lesser, um, I imagine that assumption makes a bigger impact in the calculations for the mission, and I'm just wondering um, what systems or solutions are in place for readjusting um, the issues of the, the trajectory, I suppose. Yeah. Both times of months. Um, you see, when you generate, when you create a spacecraft, um, you've got some pretty high technology systems that deal with um, calculated trajectories. Um, so with that assumption that we made with the impulsive maneuvers, it just makes the modeling process a lot easier. It is possible to model um, continuous burns, long duration burns. Um, it just takes a lot more time, effort, computing power to do so. Um, so I know that there's electric propulsion systems of satellites. So a lot of the time when a satellite's in orbit, um, it gets bombarded with solar radiation, which decays the orbit. Um, there's also very low pressure gases up in the, in space. So if the orbit is quite close to the atmosphere, you do get some drag, which kind of decays the orbit as well. So they do use electric propulsion on satellites to boost the orbit, where you burn your engine for a long period of time. Um, to get back to the, the position that you want your satellite to be in. Um, so there, there are systems out there that actually do these kinds of calculations and obviously you plan your mission in advance to be able to do those kind of things. So um, yeah, I mean, I've never done one myself. Um, one of the reasons I recommended it for the future is because I think it's a really difficult problem, um, especially for interplanetary trajectories where you've got the Earth moving, Mars moving at a different speed, you need to really get that perfect um, position and velocity to be able to meet Mars at the moment of time. So it's a really difficult problem, but people have solved it before. So, no question for Bex. Sorry, got a quick question for myself actually. Um, so I sort of noticed a lot of the sort of things you were used to sort of develop the mission architecture. Were you surprised at the amount of uh, open source and readily available materials that allowed you to sort of develop and mission architectures? NASA are really good at having things open source. So using their trajectory browser, um, using their uh, Mars mission architecture, it's all open source stuff. They, they're really good at uh, putting things out publicly. So I would say I was surprised. Um, I have used NASA documents, NASA software before. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can find a lot out on the internet these days. Uh, and yeah, I guess Rolls Royce was a great help with that as well because they've been researching these kind of things for decades. So they pointed us in the right direction really early on, which allowed us to kind of take it as far as we, we did. So yeah, I'd say I was. Fantastic, thank you very much. We've um, got a couple of questions actually in the chat as well, so I'm gonna quickly bring those up. So we've got a question from uh, student S. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, my question uh, to Sam is: Have nuclear reactors considered for long-term deployment missions, such as the new space station, considering the ISS is scheduled to retire in 2030? Yeah. So mentioned SpaceX got contract to um, develop their Starship to transport NASA astronauts. To lunar surface. As part of those Artemis missions, the latter ones are to develop something called the Lunar Gateway, which is a space station that's going to orbit around um, the moon. So we're kind of moving from having our astronauts within 400 miles of Earth in the ISS 
to having them permanently stationed on another solar, solar body. Um, the benefits of having space station orbiting uh, the moon is it's a good stepping stone to Mars. So once um, we have an established base on Mars, an established uh, space station orbiting Mars, uh, sorry, the moon, uh, we'll be able to send spacecrafts to dock with the lunar gateway, refuel, once to get to the moon gateway, there's very little gravity to escape um, the moon's orbit. So it makes it much easier to then go on to Mars in the future. So, yeah, I guess that answers your question. Excellent, thanks. Um, there's uh, two more questions in the chat and then I'll hand over to Oliver. Um, so there's, there's two questions from uh, Dominic M. Um, with nuclear systems, you save weight on oxidizer, but how does the weight of the reactant cooling systems compare to the weight of the oxidizer? And I'll, Good yeah. question. So you get a mass saving from there, but then I also mentioned you need things like disk shields, you need that, that long um, structure to separate your uh, engine from your passengers. You need all the cooling systems, typically you need um, fluid to work those cooling systems to reject that heat. So um, yeah, there is a trade-off. I haven't been able to quantify it in this study, um, but that's one of the things that Rolls-Royce are really trying to push at the moment is how do these two types of systems compare and can we get as much benefit as we think we can by assuming that that dry mass is the same. Excellent. And uh, the second question from Dominic M is, there's a high failure rate of rockets. How do you mitigate the risk of having a nuclear material on rockets that crash? So that's probably going to tie into some of your experience in hypersonics. So, switch back to the NERVA program. So this was NASA's program to develop a ground um, kind of concept of a nuclear thermal. So typically in the engineering process, you don't just design something, strap it to a rocket and launch it straight into space. You design subsystems, components um, at a very low level test them in isolation, build confidence that they do what they are supposed to do, and then you build up the complexity of what you're testing. So in the case of this example, um, yeah, obviously you test all the components and then you do ground testing like the NERVA program was supposed to be um, doing, and then you can then, once you're confident that your mm -hmm. reactor is safe enough, it's had enough, um, test runs, you're confident in the performance, you're confident in the safety mechanisms around um, the way it operates, then you can integrate it with the rest of the spacecraft, which will go undergo its own testing in isolation, and then you'll have a much more confidence that you'll be able to um, launch successfully. Um, so kind of on the flip side to that, um, one of the things I did the previous year as part of the home conference is look into uh, the policy around launching nuclear materials into space. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges with policy. So thinking about a company like SpaceX, um, eventually they're going to be a big global company, have um, sites all around the world. And one of the issues is transferring nuclear materials across borders. Um, so typically, all of the nuclear material that's been sent to space previously has been sent by governments, so NASA, Roscosmos, Chinese Space Agency, etc. Now that we're getting commercial companies to send spacecraft with nuclear materials into space, um, it becomes much more confident, um, becomes much more difficult to legislate that. So, you know, transferring materials across borders, purchasing nuclear material. Uh, launching nuclear material historically has been purely government based. Um, you know, when you launch uh, the, the Mars rover, for example, that has a nuclear power source on it, and you need the president's permission to be able to launch that. So it goes right the way up to the, the leaders of the country. Whereas um, the legislation around uh, companies is very immature. So alongside all this technology development, there has to be a lot of policy development as well to be able to actually make this a reality. So yeah, it's an interesting question. 
Um, my question kind of follows that in terms of safety, but rather than safety in terms of uh, a rocket uh, launch going down, it's more the safety to the crew when they're in transit. Um, I know we're not talking about nuclear power generation here, we're talking about nuclear propulsion, but when I think of examples and nuclear aircraft carriers and certainly nuclear submarines where there have been tragic incidents in the past where things have gone wrong and the crew have been exposed to hazardous materials. Is that still a risk here or is it just simply not a factor because it is propulsion rather than energy generation? But if it is a problem, what, what has been done to, ex, to, to explore that problem? Because uh, I know from previous experience, getting safety cases approved and things like this can be an absolute uh, nightmare on programmes. I uh, appreciate it's a long way off, but I just thought your thoughts were yeah, on that. So it's probably a little bit, maybe too early to be thinking about safety cases in terms of nuclear engines for space. Uh, what I would say is, you know, in the past, when you've launched astronauts into space, they accept risk, so they know that it's not a completely safe endeavour. You know, not just the launch, but being in space is a very hostile place to be. Um, so you definitely need um, some kind of human buy-in. Um, there's a lot of you know, safety uh, testing that needs to be done to be able to convince people especially if it's you know people like you and me the general public to convince people to actually move to mars and you know be around these hazardous materials um so yeah i haven't particularly thought about it in detail myself but yeah that is going to be a huge thing especially if we're <laughs> trying to send you know, the average joe to um yeah convince them to live on mars i think that's a mm -hmm. one of the biggest hurdles we've got thank you One, one last question from the audience. Yes, um, with the nuclear electric um, motor, is the thrust mainly absorbed by the magnets? Absorbed. Um, so, yeah, I, again, this isn't my area of expertise. Um, kind of left the propulsion side to rolls. So, yeah, I guess I probably can't give you a good enough answer. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of information out there if you're interested in researching it, but um, yeah, I probably wouldn't be able to give you a decent amount of that one. Yeah, I think in this case, it's, a, it's, it's fundamentally just a case of uh, um, Newton's sort of second law, effectively. So you're kind of accelerating this mass out of the spaceship, um, although it's going at very, very high velocity, but it's very, very low mass effectively but one of the challenges is, is ensuring like issues with the er erosion because these things are traveling at enormous speeds and then also neutralizing those so they don't effectively come back to a ship and they've actually neutralized the actual thrust they produce when they're when they exit it but yeah it's, it's fascinating so i think this is the last question so i'll, I'll hand it over thank you um so thank you very much uh, very interesting lecture i'm sure everyone was was uh, really impressed with, with what, what we heard. I think looking or thinking about the the questions and the, the, the comments that have been made by by the audience, it's really that and what I think you try to portray in, in your your lecture was the recognition of the limitations of what you've done so far. You know, let's not all get way out of the box too early when we all know that there's an, a whole load of activity. And I think one of the big things for me and particularly learning as you go through your career is learning what the limitations are of the stuff that you're doing you know and not not kid ourselves on all the time that we've got a really good answer when actually it just it just showed us what we thought was the the case but there's a whole load of other issues that have yet to be dealt with and i think that's really important thing for for um sort of young young career engineers like yourself and for me um i think it's great to see the aerospace in the in the broadest sense starting to be handed over from you know the the gray beards like like most of us in this room at the moment <laughs> into the, the the new coming and i know there's a couple of uh, cranfield students at the back who've, who've joined this lecture as well it's really it's really heartening to see that um i think i can probably see why you got the re uh, the, the any row medal as well with the presentation is very very clear and very well presented thank you um the only other thing i kind of picked up on and i know it's not exact numbers but um six and a half months versus five and a half months to get from earth to mars 
I don't know how many people in here would actually want to be on that flight, but I don't think I'm one of them yet, if I'm really honest with you. I don't think, I think I'd get so bored in never five and a half months, never mind six and a half months, so it probably wouldn't be me. And I don't know about anybody else if you would like to go, but it, I, I don't think probably, I think it'll need to be down to a bit shorter than that before I even think about it. And I very much doubt that's going to happen in, in my lifetime. So thank you very much for your, your presentation. So please join me in the usual way and say, say thank you very much. Thank you.